Well, we're on to day seven of Halloween Horror Movie Reviews, season four. And so it seems like what we're looking into today is something involving a take line of can a heart still break once it's stopped beating? By the clown cafe, your favorite meals on wheels. The menu is disgusting and it's full of special deals. Nothing here is good for you, so grab yourself a tray. Cause food's a little funny at the clown cafe. Drop on by the clown cafe. Drop on by the clown cafe. Gobble up your order quick before it runs away Cause food's a little funny at the Clown Cafe Why not visit after school and have yourselves a bite? An appetizing appetizer certain to delight We haven't done it right unless it makes your teeth decay Cause food's a little funny at the Clown Cafe Drop on by the Clown Cafe Drop on by the Clown Cafe The grub is downright gruesome but your appetite's obey Cause food's a little funny Food's a little funny Food's a little funny at the Clown Cafe Hey everyone, it's Don G. Corleone here and I'm here with a brand new Movie review, and this review is going to be for episode 7 of Halloween Horror Review Season 4. And what's today's episode? Well, today's episode is going to be for another stop-motion movie. It's not from Laika. It is from the legend, the underrated legend himself, Tim Burton. And this was his second animated feature he did. Well, okay, maybe actually third. Because I know he did Night Before Christmas in 1993. He didn't direct it, he produced it. It was directed by Henry Selleck. Then he teamed up with Henry Selleck again to do James and the Giant Peach, which wasn't really successful at the box office. I didn't get as much critical acclaim as The Night Before Christmas did. This one was the first of these three <coughs> that he actually directed himself. And this came out at the same year as another movie he did, directed, two months before this, had also it earlier released. And this is the second one he did, and it's going to be 2005's Corpse Bride. What's the plot of this movie? Well, this movie is set in the back in the late 1800s in a Victorian village. A man and woman by the names of Victor Van Dort and Victoria Everglot are bethroned because the Evergods need money or else they'll be living on the streets and the Van Dorts want to be high in society again. But when things go wrong at the wedding rehearsal, Victor goes into the woods to practice his vows. And just as soon as he gets them right, he finds, the mar he finds himself married to Emily, a corpse bride who was, mer who was literally conned, into getting conned by her love interest into getting married in private, but actually he straight up murdered her for her riches. With Victoria, while Victoria waits on the other side, there's a rich newcomer that may take Victor's place. Or he think, or we think he's rich. So two brides, one groom, who will Victor pick? So, how is this movie made? Well, the film's based on a <coughs> 17th century Jewish folktale, which Joan Raff introduced to Burton when they were finishing Night Before Christmas. Then the film began production in November 2003, while Burton was completing a th another movie he did that year, Big Fish. He continued with production on his next live-action feature, which was the Charlie and Chocolate Factory remake, and it produced similarly same time as this film. Co-director Mike Johnson spoke about how they took a more organic approach to directing the film. He said that in a handles manner, their approach was more organic, and Tim knew that he wanted the film to go as far as emotional tone and story points to hit. 
His job was to work with the crew on a daily basis and get the footage as close as possible to how he thought he wanted it. And the film was originally supposed to have been shot on film, through a last minute change by the studio helped introduce a different technology. In 1997, during pre-production of Henry Slug's feature Monkey Bone, the film cinematographer Pete Kozaki was looking for a type of filming that would streamline the process of integrating stop-motion characters with pre-filmed live actors. After finishing Monkey Bone, Kozaki continued to test cameras with a practical means of shooting feature animation digitally. Then in early 2003, production unit was not interested in digital capture for stop-motion, and the team was instead prepping the movie for a film shoot. And two weeks before filming was to begin, Kosa Cheek and visual effects consultant Chris Watts came up with a solution using digital still cameras that was deemed viable by Warner Brothers, Senior Vice President of Physical Production, and visual effects Chris DeFeria. The production then became digital, and after testing a dozen different models, Kosa Cheek opted for a, for a basic digital still camera. And the Canon EOS ID Mark, Mark II, an off-the-shelf model that was outfitted with adapters to allow the use of Nikon Prime lenses, and Kosa Cheek spoke about why he chose the camera. He said that one reason he wanted this particular camera was that its image chip and was its image chip that was just about the same size as a Super 35 film negative, so they could use Nikon lenses and treat them like regular send license to get the same effect. The same to fulfill angle of coverage. And he knew that they were going to be fighting to make this look like a real movie because they weren't shooting on film, so they wanted to at least have the optics look like movie optics. And when it came to animation, animation took place at Three Mile Studios in East London. And a dozen animators and puppeteers who put to work in production began, but that number had tripled by the end of production. And the initial group spent time developing each puppet's unique characteristics. Then the puppets themselves, built by Mackinac and Saunders, were typically about 17 inches tall, animated on set to build three to four feet off the ground, with trapdoors that allowed animators to access to the set surfaces to manipulate the puppets. The three primary characters of the movie, Victor, Victoria, and Emily, the corpse bride, were fitted with heads the size of golf balls that contained special gearing to allow the animators to manipulate individual parts of the puppets' faces. And then the animators' work was spread over 25 to 35 individual setups and stages, and with its own Canon digital camera. And a total of 32 cameras were used on the film. And the camera was outfitted with a grabber system that enabled the animators to capture frames and download them into a computer to assemble a short reel of the short being produced to check their work. <coughs> So, after the movie was shot and marketed, Corpse Bride would go on to premiere the Venice International Film Festival on September 7, 2005, and it went on to be released into theaters on September 23, 2005 in the United States, but then in the United Kingdom it would go on to be released in the theaters on October 13, 2005. And, and when, it was at, when it became box office-wise, it was a critical commercial success, it grossed $118 million worldwide against its $40 million budget, and it received praise for the animation, character, songs, and humor. And it won the National Board of Review for Best Animated Feature, and got, and got nominated at the 70th Academy Awards for Best Animated Feature, but lost to another stop-motion film, Lost the Ground Curse of the Were-Rabbit, and ironically, that also starred Alan Bonham Carter. And the film won the Annie Awards up, up Iwerks Award for Technical Achievement in 2006, where it got nominated for Best Animated Feature, Character Design, and Best Direction. Now, as for my reaction to this movie, I think this is easily one of Tim Burton's most underrated films and one of the best stop motion films of all time. The set designs are perfect, the songs are perfect, the characters are enjoyable. Victor and <coughs> the plot is pretty simple, too. Victor's parents meet Victoria and her family to attend a wedding rehearsal. Unknown to Victor's family, though, it seems Victoria's parents are also broke and desperately need the marriage to secure their future. And yet, Marriage is new to the nervous Victor, and he gets jittery at the church, and so he has to run off into the woods and has to rehearse all over again. And he jokingly recites his wedding vows and slips his wedding band onto a finger-shaped piece of what appears to be wood, but the next thing he knows, that finger was a real finger belonging to a dead bride. And she sprung alive to his offer of marriage, and Victor reels in horror and confusion as this corpse bride. He's whisked away to another world to people who have died, but have not fully passed on in peace yet. The corpse bride is part partly decomposed, and she retains much of her former beauty, and others in this strange land are just mere skeletons or rotted flesh. And it turns out the corpse bride was to be married, but her groom had evil plans for her, and she had been waiting for her true lover ever since she died. Meanwhile, on the other hand, Victoria's parents get approached by a mysterious handsome suitor named Lord Barkus, who wants to marry Victoria. And Victor must make a faithful decision to choose between the two brides, even as a dead descent on the land of living for a wedding ceremony like none other, and one groom and two brides, what what to do. So this is pretty much this was pretty much Tim Burton's next foray into stop motion animation after after they did two collaborations with Henry Selick in the 90s 
And this time he collaborated with Mike Johnson, but this time Tim Burton was the one that actually directed the film. And he and Mike Johnson direct with Economy from a relatively simple screenplay by John August, Penelope Peller, and Caroline Thompson. And the characters, especially Victor and the Corpse Bride, are well etched and create an emotional bond with the audience. And we do want... <coughs> while we do want Victor to marry his love, Victoria, we grow to feel sympathy and attachment to Emily the Corpse Bride as well. Emily's her name, guys. I'd rather just call her Emily the Corpse Bride, not just the Corpse Bride. And for the images of the dead, Burton and company do a delightful job of making what and making what, on the outset, could be grotesque and turn him into energized, playful souls. There's this terrific lore homage with a worm who keeps popping in and out of the bride's eye socket, and kind of being like her inside voice, really, kind of like the voice inside her head. And after a short time, the skeletal limbs and discolored dead no longer seem frightening or gross. And the most colorful sequences involve the world of the dead, while the living are, are painted in austere, lifeless mutes of gray. Yeah, ironically, the world where all the pe where the dead people live is much more colorful than the world where all the alive people are living. Because this is during the 1800s, which seemed like a pretty miserable time to live in. And the reason I love this film, as well, is the slowness and gentleness of the plot. When the groom wrongfully proposes to the corpse of the forest, many audiences would believe it to be ridiculous and coincidental in the way it came across, but... But it definitely conformed to the fantasy genre beautifully, and with Burton's known dark mind for that genre, it's really effective and will def definitely engage you for the plot as the stakes are raised for Depp's character as he wonders what's happening to him. And honestly, the two worlds are amazing. The land of the living, the land of the dead are definitely portrayed well, they accurately portrayed well, and the dead is it definitely shines with life and light, and strange but a different concept into the ideology of the dead. The skeletons, zombies, corpses are fantastic, gruesome, and funny, especially the same skeleton. And the living world also appears more dark and gloomy than the death world, which is definitely an interesting technique used by Burton, <coughs> and, one which, and one which is an essential make to this film. And, in and definitely, in comparison to The Nightmare Before Christmas, which is still a masterpiece, it's definitely, it definitely has improved, the animation is definitely even more improved, and it shows how far Burton's gone as a stop-motion maker. And the detail to the gruesomeness of the two worlds is amazing and breathtaking, and the creep characters are definitely splendid and confirmed to audience's expectations. Like, I don't know why Burton didn't direct any more stop-motion films after this, so he should have did more. Here. I never saw him do another stop-motion again film again ever since this movie. It really sucks. And the movie mixes the moves of the classic, Tar classic Charles Dickens novels and the 18th to 19th century horror, horror stories. And it's sprinkled with the great sense of humor and a few winks to the owl viewer. And the colors and backgrounds are beautiful with a mix of the dark bright colors and precious quirky design that characterizes Burton's design. The characters are physically well designed, their personality is well constructed and brought to life. And they are very witty and charming with those English and Scotch accents. And the dubbing is excellent and helps the characters come to life. And you definitely... Yeah, the, and much of the production team are... Definitely also, believe it or not, guys, veterans of other Burton movies. Longtime collaborators for the score, Danny Elfman provides an atmosphere of score and a handful of nifty little songs to move things along. Even the voices of the principals of Burton Illumini. First, we got some of Burton's usual collaborators, Johnny Depp and Helen Bonham Carter, who Helen Bonham Carter was at the time Burton was actually at the time in love with Tim Burton. Around the time this and Charlie Chocolate Factory came out for a while. And he gave Depp credit for voicing this burst down in character convincingly while others like, you have some other actors near like Emily Watson, Albert Finney, Christopher Lee, and Tracy Ullman, to name a few. They are quite effective at bringing their figures to life. And it's a testament to Burton's imaginative appeal that twice the usual number of major acting talents can contribute to his work. And for all those who love Burton's earlier produced efforts, such as The Nightmare Before Christmas and James and a Giant Peach, which are also stop motion films he did, well, technically speaking, James and the Chinese Peach starts off as a live-action film, but then it transcends into stop-motion once James meets the bugs. This is a worthy fall to those three. I mean, to those two. The animation itself is seamless. The characters and figures move as in real life. It's definitely a far cry from the rank and vast Christmas specials of the 60s. The set designs and costumes are definitely gothic in style. It seems that Burt was drawn from his own films or is per perpetuating his influences and evidence as evidenced in his previous films like Beetlejuice, Batman, Edward Scissorhands, Sleepy Hollow, or particularly his obsession with the good and evil in man. And it delves into perception of life versus death, who is really alive and who acts like non-living. 
And the story, yeah, it's a little bizarre, a little morbid, but it's a bur it's burned on familiar grounds. The Von Dorts and the Everglots have agreed to arrange marriage between between their two children. But, Vic, but one of them fumbles the marriage rehearsals, is sent to rehearse, unleashes, unleashes a cor Emily the Corpse Bride, and it pretty much kicks off a crazy love triangle of sorts, evolving characters from Realm of the Living and Realm of the Dead. Surprisingly, Bird managed to squeeze a couple subplots into this relatively short film, and touched on themes like arranged marriages, what's in it for both families. The Von Dorts are the newly rich, they want to add prestige to their family name, but the Everglots are bona fide aristocrats who have gone bust, are now broke, they need money to continue their lifestyle, stay face, go back into the world. Different facades of love are exhibited between Vic Victoria, Victor, and Emily, and one of which is the most conventional love at first sight, well, the other growing to love a person, and you might be able to, and the ending, yeah, you could guess the ending could be predictable, and the relations between some of the characters midway through the movie, I still might prefer an alternative ending, but if you're acquainted with Burton's works, it's typical for him in his style. You'll see it coming the way it was, as per his dark visions. <coughs> <coughs> the art and characters are very NBC-like, too, with their small heads and extremely long limbs, because, yeah, stop motion, we all know, it's very difficult to do. And watched in a digital format brings out the crispiness of the figurines. Burton loads the film with many supporting characters, each with his own zany behavior, and even spoofing characters from other movie classics. The first scenes of the movie are a comedy of manners and class straight out of Jane Austen, the two equally ghastly sets of parents duel in their respective snobberies in the first song. Hollywood at the time had never hit the climbing target with such cringe making hilarious results. Not could the shy young couple help but bond, and when Vic and when Victor wakes up in the underworld married to a gushing, truly corpse, convinced he is her destiny, who could blame him for his desperation to get away from her back home by fair means or foul? And from the opening scene onward, there's trouble brewing, and you know very well that nothing could go right when you hear the parents of both wedding parties sing, everything must go according to plan. This, it's definitely one of the most memorable songs of the film, but I think the more better song of the, of the film is Honestly Remains of the Day. It's when Victor meets all the dead people and stuff, and that skill, and that's and that one scene skeleton pretty much tells the story of how this corpse bride died and and why she's now pretty much waiting for this marriage to be at peace and stuff. It kind of introduced us to the character and how she got into that world in the first place, and it's her, and the first song serves to set the stage. Indeed, everything has to go according to plan. The bride's parents are dying need of money. The groom's parents want to seek a better reputation. But this marriage can make, and hopefully, and according to them, maybe this marriage could make them all happy except the bride and the groom. And it's at their old white rehearsal that our young couple, Victor and Victoria, first meet. They have this brief moment alone which the parents seem to believe that they can make this work. The feelings of affection also begin to become apparent in this scene. Perhaps they'll learn to love each other. Then the rehearsal gets underway. And we meet. And, it's, and they're about to be wedded by a priest who's voiced by Christopher Lee. Who would also who would also collaborate with Burton and Depp in the other feature they did, Charlie and Chocolate Factory, the same year as this. And then we find out what a new rock and scatterbrain person Victor is. He can't get his vows right, and the more times he makes a mistake, the more patient everybody becomes, and the more likely he's making another another mistake. He takes too many steps up front. He keeps botching the vows, and he can't light the candle he's supposed to light. But then, of course, once he gets the ring out, he drops the ring. It goes under Victoria's mom's dress. It, he accidentally drops a candle on a bit of her dress. And then, and our villain of the movie we even get introduced to in the same scene. Barkus pretty much puts it out. And then Christopher Lee's character makes makes Victor go out and practice his, do, practice his vows properly and to not come back until he learns them. And Victor's forced to flee. Then he finds refuge in a forest. He gets his vows finally right. He, he puts on the ring, pretends it's Victoria's finger. He thinks it's a twig, but it's the... And then we find out it's actually the ring of a woman. It's actually the remains of a woman's hand. He's taken back to the judge chick in the wedding dress. And the wedding dress pops on the ground and, and says that she does take him in. And for a while, Victor tries to rid himself of this, of this dead bride. But eventually he does fall in love with her because she's more alive than those that can breathe. But he also does have a soft spot for Victoria, who, in Victor's absence, has been betrothed by her parents, and is now forced to marry Barkus Bittern, who clearly has a more cynical role in the whole story, and Victor's being pulled in two directions, but can choose only one. But a secret of this film is that this movie's not a horror film, 
that could have been made out of the same material. The grotesquery anchors the sweetness, but does not lessen or deride it. If anything, it's the story of a love triangle as Victor pledged unknowingly, unknowingly to two, unwillingly to two when it comes to love the both. One telling little, inc little instinct comes during the wedding rehearsal. And Victoria untroublously comes to the rescue, re relighting her fiance's candle in that moment and during the rehearsal scene. And the voice acting is an absolute treat. Johnny Depp pulls off his usual, his definitely very, his once again always great acting. Then you completely forget he's there. We're only at the character of this note. There's definitely no trace of Ed Wood or Donnie Brasco or Captain Jack Sparrow here. Here in this character. that Once again, Johnny Depp's one of the best actors of all time. And, all, and also, Alan LeBond Carr, perhaps the most tasking role of all is the corpse by herself. Whether her honestly girl is heartbroken or icing revenge. And then Willie Watson does bring a vivid sympathy to the part of Mouseville Victoria with her surprising hint of steel. But the honors are carried off by the minor characters, from the skeletal jazz-soaked cro crooner to the plum zombie cook and the gallor gallant hussar, eyeglass firmly in, dis in place despite the hole through his middle. A galaxy of carry cultures and jets poked of all the classic additions, from the underbred Van Dorts to the overplayed Patricia Lord and Lady Everglot, and their stoop scotch nanny and superstitious butler. Is it... It was definitely around this time likely a joy for audiences to find a film as tightly written and constructed as an old style feature, an animation like nothing they had seen before at the time this came out. And the filmography in this movie, furthermore, it's classic Tim Burton. Expressism, expressionism clearly it definitely has a large impact on how Burton chooses to direct the film. The sets as well as all the characters are abstract, angled, and unnatural. The characters have large dark circles around their eyes that are pale and skinny. The colors of the land of living are gray and monochromatic, and the underworld is definitely lively, multi-chromatic, and bright. And this is contrary to what one, what one might expect, but Burton uses these lighting and coloring techniques to convey the message that the living world is constrained by all loving parents, money, greed, death, anxiety, and self education The underworld is carefree in the place to be. And honestly, when it comes to Victor and Emily, I feel like Depp and Bonham Carter work fantastically off each other in this film. The former playing Victor, who is the lovable yet clumsy young man forced to the arranged marriage of Victoria Everglot with Victoria Everglot, he then winds up proposing to a, to this dead bride, and Depp and Carr, and they actually do have great chemistry in this whole film. Honestly, I honestly, I honestly enjoyed their, I think I enjoyed Victor and Emily's scenes together way more than I did Victor and Victoria's, because Victoria, she just doesn't get much development for me. At all. I mean, I feel like Emily just gets better developed as a character. It seems like a better developed love interest. And a part of me did kind of wish Victor did end up with Emily a little more. I mean, I get this. It can't really work out because technically Corpse Bride is also somewhat of a kid's film. So it wouldn't really be a kid's film if they did end up together. So I get that. But I kind of wish it was those two that ended up together more, kind of more than Victor and Victoria did. And, he, and furthermore, Depp and Carter would later reunite again two years later for, for another Burton flick that will be getting reviewed this season in a few weeks. And the finale does go decently well because once Victor tries to ditch Emily to reunite with Victoria, Emily, find, Emily literally finds out that Victor ditched her, ditched her and drags her, then drags him back, drags him back to the dead world, is angry at him and heartbroken at Victor's selfishness. But then Victor kind of realizes his mistake, and he starts to bond better with Emily. He's trying to start to bond better with Emily. He did kind of realize his selfishness in that moment. Right there. <coughs> and then, our as they're bonding, playing piano together, Victor learns of Victoria's impending marriage to Barkus from his from his family's newly deceased coach from Mayhew. He's then upset over this news, and then Victor, but then Victor decides, you know what? I'm gonna marry I'm gonna marry the I'm gonna actually marry you properly. And we're gonna have this wedding properly this time. He knows that this will require him to repay his wedding vows there in the land of the living and drink the wine of ages, which is a poison in order to join Emily in death. And he's like, I'm willing, you know what? Honestly, the bride I'm supposed to be marrying, she's going to marry another man. I've got nothing else in the world left to live for, so I'll gladly let myself die to join to join Emily in death. So, so that right there is actually good character development of the character. 
And the dead swiftly prepared for the ceremony had, and head pretty much upstairs, which is the land of the living. And the town erupts into a temporary panic upon the dead's arrival, but the living recognize her, to, and this was a moment I think I really loved the most of the film. The living recognize her departed loved ones, and they joyously reunite with them. And, and surprisingly, I think this was honestly one of my favorite scenes in the film, and it's a very heartwarming moment seeing the dead aren't being cliche, they're not terrorizing the inhabitants, and they actually soon recognize most of the inhabitants as their still alive loved ones in this moment. In this moment, it's beautiful here. A boy's reuniting with his dead grandpa. One blind elderly woman's reuniting with her dead husband. Right here. This was a nice moment. But meanwhile, the chaos causes his panic barkus to expose his poor financial standing and his intentions to marry Victoria for her supposed wealth, and it leads her to reject him. Then we get to the actual wedding of Victor and Emily. Victoria, after Victoria runs off, she witnesses Victor and Emily's wedding, and Victor completes his vows, and he's getting ready to drink the poison, but Emily sees Victoria, decides to stop Victor from killing himself, and she realizes that she's going to be denying Victoria her chance to live happily with him. And Emily decides to let Victor and Victoria be together, decides they're better off together. But then Barkus arrives, decides to kidnap Victoria. He still does not care that she's poor. And Emily recognizes, in a shocking twist here, that Barkus was actually that fiancé who murdered her. Right there. And so Victor duels with Barkus to protect Victoria. And during the duel, Emily intervenes, saves Victor's life, and Barkus accepts defeat, but he mockingly toasts Emily for dying unwed, and unknowingly drinks the poison, and then he dies, and the dead just... And the dead can't really interfere with the can't really interfere with Barkus at this time because he's still in the living. But now that Barkus is dead, they're finally able to take retribution and torture him to death for his crimes. And pretty much so it's pretty much they're pretty much dragging him to hell. And Emily, Emily's now freed from her torment. She's finally now at peace. Now that her now that her treacherous lover is finally now burning in hell. She, re she releases Victoria, I mean, releases Victor of his vow to marry her and, and returns his ring and allows him and Victoria to finally marry. And she steps into the moonlight. She transforms into this butterfly so that fly in the sky. And Victor and Victoria watch and embrace. So it's a decent enough way to end this 77 minute feature. But I did kind of want to see a bit of an aftermath because I felt the ending was a little abrupt. And now, and yeah, that leads me to some problems. Now, the story is quite original, but it is oddly predictable at times, and dialogue is simple but sometimes inspired, such as can a heartbreak once it stopped beating. And what we as the audience are kind of supposed to empathize with Victor's dilemma, and having to choose between Victoria and the corpse bride. Well, most of the first half of the film, he's I think he's just kind of this wishy-washy character that just doesn't have much backbone for the first bit, and sometimes does kind of come off as a a little bit selfish when he ditches Emily at that time. That's what I kind of thought. But thankfully, he but he did realize his selfishness, though. I kind of just wish they kind of gave him a little bit more of a backbone. He does kind of by the end of the film. Though at least, and at the end of the movie, when the corpse bride makes her metamorphosis, like, the trouble's that there's kind of no really vehicle for this change, and it doesn't ruin this movie... I was kind of, I kind of just was like, what happens? Like, and you think that the maggot who resides as the voice inside the corpse bride's head could have been revealed to really be a caterpillar. And there you would have the vehicle for the change, though. And, uh, well, and also, once again, I kind of did wish that Victor and Emily ended up together. They just had they they just had the better chemistry for me. They just had the better scenes for me. I mean, just Victoria's just not that well developed, and uh, her her and Victor just kind of have a eh, chemistry. They're just I mean, just Victor and Emily's scenes were better. I had a better I had a much better time watching those two scenes, and I so yeah, I kind of wish they did end up together. It would kind of ruin the message of the film, but. I would have liked it better, but I just would have liked it better. They just felt like a better couple. But I think those are the only problems I have with this film because I still think Corpse Bride is very underrated. So in the end, I definitely want to, I definitely recommend checking out 
worth, I would definitely recommend watching it by Corpse Bride for those who love Tim Burton and want to see and want to see him actually helm a stop motion movie in his hands this time, not through Henry Selleck's hands this time. Anyways, that's it for my review of Corpse Bride. I wonder if I'm going to rate Corpse Bride. Here's how I'm going to rate this movie. So overall, if you love stop motion films and Burton films combined as a whole, then totally watch and buy Corpse Bride for your collection, no doubt. And if you're wondering how I'm going to rate Corpse Bride, I'm going to give Corpse Bride a 9 out of 10. And there we go. That wraps up the episode or review for Corpse Bride. So you're wondering, what's going to be the next episode? Well... Next episode, we're going right back into the 2010s. It was around the late 2010s, the final two years of the 2010s. And it's going to be for an A24 movie. Or A24, A24, whatever you want to call them. Either way, it's from that studio. And it was for a horror film that was ended up so far being the only good movie that this controversial director has done. And it was from 2018. And it might get me some flack from subscribers, but whatever. If you're wondering, is it a hereditary? Yeah, it's hereditary. Hereditary is the next episode. So until then, guys, that'll be it for this episode. Thank you all for watching. If you like this, want to see more, don't forget to like, subscribe to Don G. Corleone.